did you have a sense that the chaos Zero was jumping into was dangerous, or was it just the pull of it? Like, I couldn't swallow this economic stuff. Once I was exposed to why it was so wrong, then I was on a crusade to make it right. And that's been part of my nature all through my life. So welcome in, everybody. So I'll quickly introduce myself now, and I'll be giving a lot of background on, on how I got to be the critic of economics that I am. So I did my PhD back at the New South Wales University, finishing in 1998. I've been a professor of economics since 2006 at a university in Australia and then in London. And now I'm actually living in Amsterdam and being a voluntary visiting scholar there. The catalyst that got me into this was learning a piece of economic theory, which you don't normally learn unless you're doing a master's or a PhD program. And if you're learning at that point, you've already accepted so much that you tend not to be critical as a result of this argument. But it was a paper called The General Theory of the Second Best. That's a link to the paper. And to know why this paper was so significant or should be so significant, I've got to explain the type of stuff you got taught at university and you still largely get taught today about the theory of supply and demand. It's this idea of utility maximizing consumers, confronting profit maximizing firms in a marketplace that balances their desires. And it began in the 1870s as a dominant school of economic thought. It was around as early as the 1800s from a guy called Augustin Cournot, who you may have heard, and if you heard of Cournot oligopoly theory, that was developed by Cournot back in 1801 or 1802. But it didn't become dominant until the 1870s, and then it was codified most effectively by Alfred Marshall, and he was the one who gave us all these drawings. So this drawing, which is taken from an image of his book, Principles of Economics. Normally, people have the detail, the substantive argument in the body and then deviations in the footnotes. What Marshall did instead was all the, the nuances were in the body and all the summarized stuff was in the footnotes. So in fact, I, you can actually regard modern economics as being written in the footnotes of Marshall's principles. So what you've got there is a simultaneous determination of both quantity on the horizontal axis and price on the vertical axis, and even that is a mathematical error, that they should be the other way around because price is supposed to be the independent variable and quantity the dependent variable. But this is the way Marshall introduced it and economists have stuck with it ever since. So he says, when supply and demand are in equilibrium, and that's at point A, the amount of the commodity being produced is the equilibrium quantity. The price is the equilibrium price. Funnily enough, Marshall forgot to draw that. He doesn't have the equilibrium price shown in his own drawing said, but it's stable. That is, if price is displaced a little from it, it will tend to return as a pendulum oscillates about its lowest point. There's a belief that not only is there a supply and demand intersection, it's an equilibrium. The system will return to it. And that is a social welfare maximizing point from the point of view of neoclassical economics. So you have this argument that consumers get what's called a consumer surplus. Any area above the equilibrium price and below the demand curve is what consumers get out of market interaction. For the producers, it's the opposite, everything above the supply curve and below the price line. And this is how it's shown in a modern textbook. This is Mancure, which I regard as one of the most interesting examples of brain dead thinking ever published. But that's the sort of thing that students learn. In equilibrium with perfect competition, you get maximum welfare and you have no loss of welfare going to the consumer or the producer. Now, this was upset in the 1930s by Roy Harrod, who's a very unusual character in the history of economic thought, and he developed the concept of marginal revenue. He didn't call it that initially. In thinking more deeply about the structure that Marshall had drawn, he came up with a new concept and realized that Marshall's thought was incomplete. What this meant was that when you have a downward sloping curve, the price line that Marshall drew in that initial diagram, Marginal revenue is less than price because total revenue is price times quantity. Marginal revenue is the change in price times quantity. And you do your calculus that comes out as price plus the rate of the slope demand curve, which is negative, multiplied by quantity. Therefore, marginal revenue is less than price. And this, when Harrod devised this, he realized there's a missing curve in Marshall's diagram. And this is where Harrod introduced it in the 1930. Great timing, by the way, beginning of the Great Depression. And we now consider the case where the source of supply is not small. So the con conventional thing economists assume is, and this applies back to Marshall as well, that if firms are small, they can't have any effect on the market price. That's a mathematical fallacy, but 
I'll come to that later in the lectures. So he said, when you have a source of supply, a firm, which is not small relative to the overall market, then you have a falling demand curve where the curve is not horizontal, which of course, if it's falling, it's not horizontal. The output is not determined by the intersection of demand and marginal cost, the supply curve shows the price per unit, which producers are willing to supply, but you can deduce another curve. And he first of all called that the increment of aggregate demand curve, which ultimately became marginal revenue. So that drawing there, which is from, from Harrod's 1930 paper is the first time marginal revenue was shown in an economic model. Now, from this point on, economists run, they had the concept of perfect competition already and monopoly as well. But now they started to very strongly distinguish the two because they realized that only under what they call perfect competition would demand be equal to marginal revenue. So according to the model of perfect competition, and by the way, it's very important to remember that economics is a non-pejorative normal science. So perfect doesn't mean perfect, pardon me, but I get, I just can't take this stuff seriously after half a century of attacking it. So in perfect competition, firms are supposed to be price takers. They just accepted whatever the market price was and they supplied it at that price. And their demand curve is therefore horizontal. And that ends up meaning you, the perfect competition operates with on the demand curve rather than marginal revenue. But if you have monopoly or the big hit of the 1930s was this model of imperfect competition, then individual firms were what they call price makers. And as they increase their quantity of being produced, the price being demanded would fall. Now, Marshall's equilibrium point applied only if perfect competition applied. If you have monopoly, then there's what they call a dead weight loss. So they say that with the marginal revenue sloping downwards, the quantity that maximizes profit for the monopoly producer will be where the marginal revenue curve intersects with marginal cost. So they'll produce at this quantity and sell at this price. So the price is greater than the point of intersection. So they're making what are called monopoly profits. And that also applies where you've got a labor union, but in the opposite case, because the marginal cost curve now has its own companion called marginal social cost. I'm not sure I fully understand. Why would marginal costs increase with quantity? It doesn't. One of the many fallacies, and I've done some recent work on that, and I've actually later in the lectures developed an accurate model of what firms actually do. And it has constant or falling marginal cost, a markup above that, Profit maximizing behavior means you sell as many units as possible. So these guys never understood the concept of startup costs. They have no effing idea of the real world. They're sitting in their armchairs having fantasies. And, and frankly, I wish they were watching something rather than doing it to economics. That'd be much less damaging. So what they saw was that this is the bad situation. Assume rising marginal costs, and I trash that in a few lectures time. Atomized co-consumers are the best possible situation. What you want is atomistic suppliers on one side and atomistic consumers on the other. You don't want either being aggregated. So economists, and I remember this as a child, and I mean like as a 17 year old or 16 year old, when I learned this at, uni at school using textbooks that are probably more advanced than first and second year textbooks these days. They've really dumbed them down quite significantly. The original textbook was Samuelson's PhD thesis called Foundations of Economic Analysis. That was the original textbook and it was incredibly dense. And over time, they've simplified and simplified and made it a much more trivial argument. But it makes you a critic of both trade unions and monopolies. Okay. Now, in the real world, of course, we have both. We have, if you think about the wage labor bargaining, certainly back when I'm talking now in the 70s, you had the employer associations on one side, bargaining with trade unions on the other, the AFL, CIO, and all those sorts of organizations. So if you have both, what happens if you abolish one, but not the other? Now, that was the focus of what's called the theory of the second best. That's why I've mentioned that to begin with. So if you're one step from perfection, if you have monopolies or you have trade unions, but not both, then if you abolish one with that one, you increase social welfare. So get rid of the trade union and things are better. And that's often as far as economists ever think about this. That's one reason unions have declined so much in the last 50 years of economists have been hostile to them all the way through that period in advising governments to be hostile as well. But what if you have both monopolies and trade unions? So employer associations and trade unions and wage bargain. Well, it's Frank Still, he's retired as professor of political economy and I said, very, still a very close friend. He showed that social welfare would fall. If you went from where there were two imperfections to only one, 
you made the system worse. And I remember sitting there in shock because until this point, I just assumed the same old thing that each time you get rid of one of these market imperfections, you'll make the world a better place. So as you start to approximate the textbook, you'll improve how well the world functions. Here was proof using conventional economic theory that was false. Okay? Abolish one or the other, you make the situation worse. Now, I was really quite in shock. My reaction was that if it's this fragile, I mean, all you've got to admit that there are two imperfections and suddenly the arguments about what you do with one imperfection are false. There's got to be something wrong. We had two textbooks at that stage. Lipsy was one and Samuelson was the other. There was no mention of it in Lipsy, which I had with me at the time. I checked Samuelson again, no mention there. So I stopped trusting the textbook. I thought, my God, I'm being lied to by the textbook. I bet it, what's in the library itself? And I went down for the first time in my life. This is about three months into being, maybe four or five months into being a, a student. I went down to read the journals. I was doing first year mathematics at the time, actual mathematics, not the garbage they teach in mathematical methods for economists. So I was learning from top class mathematicians how to analyze differential equations and so on. And in this, I found another paper by Paul Samuelson, the ex author for one of my textbooks, admitting that the theory of production and distribution we were being taught in that, those lectures was false. And th this is the quote from the final section of that paper. And th imagine, again, the impact of somebody who's been learning from a textbook, reading it, this is what the textbook writer said about an academic debate he'd been in for the previous this stage, 11 years that I'd heard nothing about in my courses, and it wasn't in the textbook, even in his textbook. Pathology illuminates healthy physiology, except for a range of non-conventional economists. Merit our gratitude for demonstrating that re-switching, which is a technical uh, description of changing from one technology to another and back again as you reduce the price of that technology, which was not supposed to happen. You're supposed to get a monotonic change. This was switching between two. I said, that's a logical possibility in any technology, and there turns to be no unambiguous way of saying whether a particular process is capital intensive or not, which again, what has been caught in the textbook. He said, and so I love this, Samuelson writes well, okay? which is one of the reasons he's been so dangerous. If all this causes headaches for those nostalgic for the old time parables of neoclassical writing, and in that he's referencing a previous paper of his, which was demolished by Garagnani, we must remind ourselves that scholars are not born to live an easy existence. We must respect and appraise the facts of life. Now, if only he'd done it, because he didn't. There was no mention of this debate in the textbook that I was reading. He had a much more serious consideration of Marx in later versions of his book, which is peripherally affected by this, but there was nothing about it. So the more I read the journals, the more I found contradiction of the textbooks. And I also found absurd intellectual gymnastics to get over those problems. So for example, this, this was absolutely critical. This was a paper written in 1960, as you can see, saying if the output system is globally stable, the price system is unstable and vice versa. That relates to something called the Perron-Frobenius theorem from pure mathematics. When you apply to what are called computable general equilibrium models, it means that either they have unstable prices or unstable quantities. Because what's called the dominant eigenvalue is greater than a limit for either of those two, and you, you will not converge to equilibrium. That meant that if there was more than one commodity, and you need more than one commodity to have prices in the first place, relative prices, then your production system was unstable. And so I went, are there other approaches to economics? So I started reading, again, looking for people who said they were non-neoclassical, and I found a brilliant book called Theory of Economic Dynamics from 1954. Again, when I was one at the time that was published. So I found those and they were remarkable. So with the mathematical foundation, I was learning differential equations in applied mathematics, and I was wondering why I wasn't being taught them in economics at the time. So I was very familiar with alternative approaches. I realized that if you weren't doing a pure mathematics course and you were swallowing what was being taught by the mathematics for economist lecturer, you were taking stuff on faith. You didn't know how stuff was derived. You didn't know about stability conditions, et cetera, et cetera. So in doing all that, having read everything I had, I decided to write a book called Debunking Economics. And that is something I know that still has a major impact upon lots of students today. Rather than this development push me completely away from mainstream economics, the global financial crisis happened in 2007. And that should have been the end of mainstream economics, because if you read the people like Bernanke, Summers, Krugman, 
all the mainstream figures, they thought we are going to have a fabulous year in 2008. They had no idea it was coming and the policies they recommended made the recovery worse and it increased the inequality that we've experienced over time. So economics has to change. Mainstream economics simply has to go. It's been an obsolete paradigm really since the mid 1910s, because that's when the peron Frobenius theorem was worked out by applied mathematicians and that demolished the whole idea of equilibrium pricing, but they're still teaching equilibrium pricing more than a century later. Now classical economics has been as wrong about the nature of the economy as Earth-centric astronomy was about the nature of the universe. So we need a new paradigm, not just new models, a whole new paradigm is needed. If you're like many other truth seekers and want to learn 50 years of real economics from me in only seven weeks, you'll have my new seven-week Rebel Economist Challenge as well. To apply, go to apply.stevecanfree.com. If you qualify, you can attend my lectures, ask me questions personally every week, and make friends with a great group of like-minded people. So again, like many others, go to apply.stevecanfree.com to apply as well for the seven-week Rebel Economist Challenge. Good luck.